Hi everybody. If you've read an article recently about psychedelic drugs, chances are it was all about their potential as mental health treatments. But even with all this great press, psychedelics are still illegal in most of the world and you can face some pretty serious jail time for possession. But all of that might be changing. So some states and cities in the US have recently decriminalized psychedelics. And here in the UK, the press recently reported that Prime Minister Boris Johnson, of all people, is interested in rescheduling psilocybin. So if you're under 50, the war on drugs has been going on for your, your entire life. And the idea of the UK or the US legalizing magic mushrooms might seem a little bit strange. This is a topic I care about a lot, and it's also not the first time I've seen headlines promising that it's all about to happen. So I am a bit wary, but I'm also feeling hopeful. And to see how likely legalization actually is, I spoke to some of the leaders in the field, including Professor David Nutt. So Professor Nutt is a vocal critic of drug policy, and he was famously dismissed from the UK government's Advisory Council for the Misuse of Drugs way back in 2009 for pointing out that ecstasy is safer than horse riding, which in fact it is. The lies that have been told about psychedelics are some of the worst lies ever told about any drug. And the censorship of research, which has persisted now for over 50 years, is the, is the worst censorship of research and clinical therapy in the history of the world. This is an outrageous, outrageous insult to humanity and to people who need the treatment. I also spoke with Crispin Blunt, who's a British member of parliament, and he's been campaigning for psilocybin to be rescheduled. And there is not a single public policy reason I can find as to why uh, psilocybin should remain in the schedule that it is. We're not talking about legalization. Well, all we're talking about is enabling uh, more research to be done uh, on psilocybin. And to see what a successful legalization campaign looks like, I spoke with Tom Eckhart, who, along with his wife Sherry, successfully led the campaign to legalize psilocybin therapy in Oregon. Uh, we won with something of a mandate, you know, 56% of the vote. That's 1.3 million people voted yes on psilocybin therapy and services in Oregon. Yeah. Definitely got a kick out of just the fact that everybody in Oregon was presented the vote and had to think about psychedelic services and what that meant. And it started a real conversation here. It was almost a kitchen table kind of issue where folks wanted to learn about it and, uh, and that led to uh, the victory. I think the UK is quite an interesting case study and Professor Nutt knows more about drug policy here than almost anybody. He now heads up Drug Science, uh, who are the UK's leading independent scientific body on drugs, as well as heading up the famous psychedelic research group at Imperial College. So some people might be aware of this and some people might not, but in 2009, you were on the government's advisory council for the misuse of drugs, and you, um, you had kind of a falling out with them very publicly, which brought into the mainstream this whole conversation about drug policy, and it had to do with ecstasy and horse riding. So I wondered if you could talk about what exactly happened. Well, we were debating and reviewing the harms of ecstasy. The government was absolutely convinced it was had to be a schedule one class A drug alongside crack cocaine and crystal meth. And I published a paper saying, well, actually, you know, maybe the harms of ecstasy have been a bit exaggerated. And if you look at them systematically and in a transparent way, using a whole range of criteria, which I developed over the previous decade, turns out that ecstasy is not that harmful. In fact, it's less harmful than horse riding. And of course, that created absolute hysteria because there's nothing Brits love more than their horses and riding horses. And, and what, was the, what was the outcome of that? What, what actually happened uh, after that to your role there? Well, I got censored for that by a Home Secretary at the time called Jackie Smith. And then, then they brought in a new Home Secretary. And uh, a few months later, I was on the radio and I was showing the results of this uh, analysis, which showed basically that alcohol was more harmful than, than uh, LSD. So I made the mistake of saying on the radio, public, you know, the broad, you know, the morning news that everyone listens to, that LSD was less harmful than alcohol. And the world went mad. 
I mean, literally, I went from one statement. I spent the rest of the day doing TV interviews across. It was on the front page of USA Today. Absolutely, the world went completely mad. And then I got sacked the next day. Now, so, and you've been, you've been quite instrumental since then in uh, bringing psilocybin therapy back, back into the mainstream um, with your, your work through drug science and also uh, through um, the psychedelic research group at Imperial College. So it's, it's 11 or so, maybe, you know, more than 11 years since mm. that, uh, since 2009, when everything kicked off. Mm. Um, how have things changed in your view or have things changed with drug policy? Well, a few things have changed. The first is it's, there's a much more open debate. That hasn't actually made um, the government's policy on recreational drugs any more logical. In fact, we, since my sacking, we brought in this Psychoactive Substances Act, which basically bans anything that works on the brain, whether it's good or bad, which is a very regressive and, and backward piece of legislation. But on the, on the, I suppose there have been some positives, and the positives have been around the utility of psychedelics and also cannabis as medicines. And a few years ago, three years ago now, uh, cannabis was made, medical cannabis was made a medicine in Britain. It's not being used very much, but at least it's available. And we're campaigning now to move psychedelics in, down the same path. And so you mentioned there something I think a lot of people comment on about drug policy globally, but, but particularly in the UK, that it's not particularly logical. Um, and it seems it hasn't been logical probably since the 1970s. Why do you why do you think that is? Why is it so persistent? Well, I think when, if you look at drug policy over the last about the hundred, well, the last 150 years, when you can see the beginnings of modern policy developing in about the 1880s, uh, the drivers have always, almost always, been political rather than health, uh, and uh, and. In the, the reality is almost all drug laws are made for political benefit of, the, of the, the party that's actually in power or wanting to get in power. And the UK drug laws, which were brought in in 1971, the Misuse of Drugs Act, it almost mimics, and it was very much driven by the USA. We, 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 essentially, we've, we've done pretty much what the US have told us to do over the last 50 years in terms of drug policy, with, with only one exception which is we kept heroin as a medicine, whereas they banned it. But apart from that, we've uh, essentially done whatever they've told us. Sometimes we've lagged by a few years, but in the end, we've always conceded. So drug policy reform in the UK has a complicated history like it does pretty much everywhere. But MP Crispin Blunt, who runs a conservative drug policy reform group, is trying to move things forward by campaigning for psilocybin to be moved from Schedule 1 to Schedule 2, which means it could be prescribed by doctors. There is no conceivable public policy reason why it shouldn't be in Schedule 2. Um, and when I was first approached about this, this just seemed a blinding glimpse of the obvious. This would be a, a pushover to get this done. And rather depressing, we've run into, um, you know, two years later, we're still uh, fiddling about um, having to make arguments from uh, first principles um, and run into the, uh, frankly, some pretty just a disgraceful, immoral, um, wrong-headed delaying tactics from the Home Office, who appear to be uh, incapable of grasping uh, when there is a huge case for reform and the massive benefits that might accrue um, if they engaged in a proper, fair assessment of the evidence. Uh, yeah, I know Drug Science did a survey quite recently, a few months ago, looking at attitudes towards rescheduling psilocybin across the UK. And I think it was around 55% in favor and, and around 30 something percent um, saying they weren't quite sure, didn't have enough information. So when you look at data like that, it does seem like there's a public desire. There's, a, there's been a huge shift in perceptions around psychedelics, perhaps in the last decade. Um, so what, what do you think is going on? Um, in the Home Office and, and in government where, where you're hitting these roadblocks? Um, do you think it's a lack of, uh, is there a fear around it? It's, it, it, it's a lack of imagination. It's, it's a, a, a very old fashioned and outdated approach to risk. And uh, what I call, and, and a, obviously a, a total failure to uh, properly appreciate the potential benefits uh, that could come to uh, the most serious elements of mental health uh, problems here if um, what 
at least appears at first glance to be the emerging implications of research are turn out to be correct. But you can't do that until you've got the research to scale. Um, and if your regulations don't enable you to do the research, then uh, we're going to spend a yet more time, uh, meaning that people don't get access to uh, treatment for trauma, addiction, um, and depression. Crispin Blunt's argument is that rescheduling is being held up by a particular branch of the UK government, the Home Office. But there are other barriers as well. Boris Johnson, UK Prime Minister, has said, yes, he'll look at it, and yes, he's open to rescheduling psilocybin. How, how likely do you think that is? And are these kind of like political rumors? Do you think there's substance to them? What's your take on it? Oh, I'm, I'm absolutely sure that Boris would be perfectly happy with it being rescheduled as a medicine. I mean, there was no reason for it not to be a medicine. It was a medicine in the 50s and 60s. It's remarkably safe. There's lots of data showing that it's effective. I, I'm, the, the resistance, to be honest, is actually coming more from the medical profession than from regulators, I think. Uh, I mean, obviously, making reclass, rescheduling psilocybin from Schedule 1 to Schedule 2 would have allowed doctors to use it. But what we've seen in the UK with rescheduling cannabis from 1 to 2 is that most doctors don't want to use it because they they want traditional controlled trials and we don't have that really for um, either for medical cannabis or for psilocybin at present. Although the good news, of course, is just last week, the first traditional psilocybin trial, the COMPASS trial, the dose finding trial was reported. And that did show what we would have predicted that the 25 milligram, the, the psychedelic dose did have a, a significant and powerful effect on resistant depression. So, so we're almost there now, I think, in terms of proof yeah, that's, it's very interesting to hear you say that there's there's resistance, resistance coming from the medical institution. You know, that's an idea I haven't um, uh, explored that much. And, you know, one of the arguments I've heard is we need more trials. We need more data, especially around psychedelics. Um, what I'm always curious about is how much more data do we need? You know, is, is there a certain amount of trials, a certain amount of years? What, what, what What's your take on that? Well, the reality is we've got 15 years of evidence from 19, 1953 to 1967. We know these drugs are effective and safe. We don't, you know, there is, we don't need to do any more safety data. The reason doctors are resistant is because most modern doctors have now become seduced into the idea, or, or I think they've become lazy, unless companies tell them that they've done a trial that shows that their drug works. And unless NICE, our National Institute of Care Excellence or whatever, says it's cost-effective, doctors won't do it. We've almost de-skilled de doctors in thinking about innovation in terms of treatment. And uh, and that's the problem. And, and of course, doctors aren't trained. Doctors don't know anything about psychedelics. In fact, the other problem, of course, is that they've also spent the last 50 years telling people how dangerous these drugs are. And it, it kind of sticks in their craw when they have to say, oh, well, we weren't quite right about that. <laughs> They don't want to be admit. They don't want to have to face up to the fact that they've actually been misleading people. Um, there's there's another element to this as well that um, is maybe worth exploring, which is the economic incentives. You know, I've heard people comment on the fact that traditional mental health treatments like SSRIs, for example, antidepressants, um, you know, they they have a share of the market, and psychedelic therapy, for example, might be a threat to that. Do you think there's there's substance to that argument? Not much. I think there's definitely there's definitely economic argument in favour of the uh, uh, of the SSRIs because they're cheapest chips, but but because they're cheapest chips, there is no innovation. Almost no companies left in the world are working in mental health space, which is why we need psychedelics. Because if the companies aren't doing the innovative research, you know we need someone else to be doing it, like us academics or or our therapists. So never was there a greater need for novel treatments, and they will not be provided by the industry. And, and then, of course, the other side of the coin is that the, the mental health treatment has always been seen as, oh, well, is it really important? The value added given to mental health treatments has always been pretty low. I mean, so traditionally, developing a new antidepressant, you could not get more than, you couldn't charge in Britain more than £30 a month for a new antidepressant. Now, the challenge to the psychedelic field is to bring in psychedelic therapy at less than 30 pounds a month. Now that isn't gonna be easy. 
uh, is certainly, you know, a, a, a session costs many thousands of pounds. So what we need to do is, is basically get the data out there that shows that the enduring benefits of psychedelics end up making it cost effective. And there is another twist to this, which I think is important, is that there's no doubt now from our work, and I almost certainly others, that the psychological effect of psychedelics is somewhat better than traditional medication. We've shown that in our recent trial against escitalopram, and the side effect burden is less. So we need to cost that in as well. We need to see the holistic picture in terms of quality of life rather than simply the cost per change in, say, a, a score, say, on the Hamilton depression rating score. It seems like a very different paradigm of treating mental health with, with psychedelics compared to, say, an antidepressant that you come and get resubscribed for and you, you kind of on your own with it. I mean, I, I'm in, in fact a participant in one of uh, one of the clinical trials at Imperial right now with continuous infusion DMT. Um, and that's a, you know, it's, it's beautifully held and it's and there's a lot of attention on just me. And of course, this is a clinical trial, so it's a different setting, but the amount of care, the amount of focus on one person, and my, my wife worked on the that acetalopram psilocybin trial, and I was very struck by just how much attention each person gets. It seems so different to what you get on the NHS normally, as, as hard as they try to give good treatment. So, you know, one, one thing I'm really curious about is what might it look like? It, best case scenario, in 10 years from now, we have um, rescheduled psilocybin. We have clinics. Um, do you have a vision of, of what it actually might look like in a way that's kind of cost effective and has gives enough access to lots of people well yes i do i mean i think we in the traditional way of thinking about medicine we have primary and secondary care and i think psychedelics will, will be secondary care they will be used by psychiatrists now one of the great things about psychedelics is that they're very interesting to young psychiatrists they're not so interesting to middle-aged psychiatrists who kind of scared about them and, and, and don't understand them. But they have the opportunity to invigorate psychiatry, to, to actually put the psychiatrist back in a kind of important role. Because currently, what does a psychiatrist do? Well, he, he writes a prescription for an SSRI for depression. Now you can actually be engaged in therapy with the patient and help, help them work through the problems and come up with new solutions. In, in a psychedelic session. So, so I would see there being psychedelic treatment centers in all major towns around the country, frankly. The, the comment you made about, um, we don't actually really engage with the patients about the, 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 their problems and try to give them the attention they need when they're depressed is, is absolutely true. And, and it's, it's because we've pushed depression back into primary care. Very, there's the only people, only the depressed people who get in to see psychiatrists now in, in, in the NHS are people who are, are so depressed that they're either not eating and drinking or they're psychotic. So, you know, pro, se secondary psychiatry has almost become the province of, of psychosis, and which is debilitating to the psychiatrist practicing. They, most psychiatrists would like to do both psychosis and, and uh, what we call neurosis, depression. So, this is an opportunity to actually allow people to do what they want to properly trained, properly effective psychotherapy with drugs to help that work better. Yeah, and just, just to, to kind of close, I wanted to maybe ask a few broader questions about your, your take on, on the psychedelic field mm. right now in general. Um, you know, one of the things I've covered a lot is the, um, the, the controversies around patenting and intellectual property, et cetera, in the space. Um, and I, I'd be curious at your take on that, if that's, you know, how closely you were following those conversations and, and what your, um, yeah, what, what your take on it is. Yeah, so, I mean, I have to, you know, I'll confess, I, I advise a number of companies who are trying to develop psychedelics and uh, largely, I think, to make some money out of them. But it's not, it's not just profiteering. I think, you know, the, these companies, gen, most people in this space actually want to do what's best. Uh, and you know, the, the reality is, I mean, just look at Compass. Compass started out as a charity, couldn't raise enough money. And then it looked at MAPS. So MAPS has been developing MDMA for PTSD. It's taken MAPS 30 years to raise enough money from philanthropy to get to a point where they actually have done a phase three trial. And I don't want to wait 30 years 
for there to be enough money to do for there to be proper trials in in psychedelics. And so, unfortunately, it currently in the West, the, that kind of commercialization is the only way forward. But as, as long as it's done with a human face, and as long as it you know it's done where with, with a where it's not where the final product isn't so expensive that no one can use it, then I, you know you know I'm I I just want it to happen, and whatever whichever way it goes, I don't mind. But I'm also very supportive of what they're doing in Oregon. I mean, great, make mushrooms available, you know, have statewide access to therapy. Well, that is amazing for two reasons. It's kind of social, it's like NHS in Oregon. That's amazing. But also it's an alternative uh, way forward. And I don't, in the end, I don't really mind as long as the therapy is available and people can access it in a safe way with trained therapists. Whatever it takes is my, you know, I'm being very pragmatic here because I, in my age, I'm 70. The last, I, I won't be able to wait 30 years to see it. I'd like it available in the next five if I live that long. Yeah, thank you for that. That's that's interesting. And, and like, you know, I've spoken to, um, for uh, for a different piece, I've spoken to, to Tom Eckhart, who, with his wife, Sherry, um, led that Oregon initiative. And, you know, I've, I've had a debate with Lars at Compass and uh, spoken to Rick Doblin about this. Mm-hmm. And it is really interesting to see all the different perspectives. It's nice to hear you say, um, to kind of, come with a pragmatic perspective of whatever works, because I think that having that healthy ecosystem, and I think most of the critique has been when uh, people perceive one player to be blocking innovation in the space and preventing different expressions or different innovations from, from coming out. And that, that's probably my perspective as well. Yeah, that's, my well, that's a very interesting, good point. But in fact, you know, look at the explosion of interest, commercial interest in the psychedelic space. That, that is... <laughs> I think they're about like possibly 10 separate kind of drugs or variants of drugs being developed. I mean, it's, 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 there's been an you know, absolute explosion of um, not necessarily conceptual innovation, but of sort of what you might call pharmacokinetic developments, you know, nasal sprays, mouth <laughs> films, intravenous injections. Mm. The field is growing very fast. So the science that w- w- will be sucked along behind that. So in the next decade, we're going to know massively more about different forms of different psychedelics and different ways of administering them, which wouldn't have happened if there wasn't the commercial investment. So just, just to close, I wondered if there's just on this topic of um, everything we've been covering, rescheduling psilocybin in the UK, psychedelics in general, if there's anything that you uh, want to express that, that you haven't touched on yet in this. Yeah, it's really important that people understand that these drugs were banned because of the Part of the, there were collateral damage to the war on drugs. They were help, it's about Nixon getting elected and also opposing the anti-war movement. The lies that have been told about psychedelics are some of the worst lies ever told about any drug. And the censorship of research, which has persisted now for over 50 years, is the, is the worst censorship of research and clinical therapy in the history of the world. This is an outrageous, outrageous insult to humanity and to people who need the treatments and look look at the wasted opportunities over the last 50 years you know let's let's try to put that to bed and, and you know get back to where we should have been in 1967 when they got banned psychedelic therapy is a very different paradigm of healing than any of our existing mental health treatments and bringing that paradigm into the mainstream isn't going to be easy and it's not going to be simple either i spoke with tom eckhart who led the campaign to legalize psilocybin therapy in Oregon to find out what it might actually involve. So Tom, it would be really good to hear to start with, what is Measure 109? Measure 109, state ballot initiative that we set in motion many years ago now, 2015, we uh, were originally inspired to set forth an initiative and a movement here in Oregon to create access to psilocybin assisted therapy as well as wellness services. So in 2020, November, 2020, uh, went to the vote, a statewide ballot. That's the you know presidential election on the ballot with everything else. Um, so it was an exciting night all in all. Uh, we won with something of a mandate, you know, 56% of the vote. That's 1.3 million people voted yes on psilocybin therapy and services in Oregon. Yeah. Definitely got a kick out of just the fact that everybody in Oregon was presented the vote and had to think about psychedelic services and what that meant. And it started a real conversation here. It was almost a kitchen table kind of issue where folks wanted to learn about it. And uh, and that led to 
uh, the victory. Yeah, what, what are the next steps and, and how do you envisage in the next few years psilocybin therapy, for example, being uh, available in Oregon? Yeah, so part of what we wrote into the initiative was this two-year development period. So once the initiative passed, it kicked off a period where we really developed the program. Now, the, the initiative itself was detailed and created a cohesive framework, but there's openings and, and, and areas that were intentionally left open so that uh, an advisory board of experts, which was appointed by the governor, uh, which was also part of what we wrote into the legislation, uh, have, would have an opportunity to really flesh out what this framework is going to look like. And it's a lot of work. So I'm on that advisory board. In fact, I chair the advisory board. I'm not speaking in that capacity right now because that work is ongoing. Um, but there's lots of areas to figure out from training to licensing, service center licensing, product licensing, how facilitators are trained, what that looks like. Um, you know, all, all, those, all those moving pieces that ultimately will come to fruition in 2023 when licenses will be uh, come online and services will start to be rendered in Oregon. Another um, sort of rising tension you, you could maybe say is is between a model like the oregon model and the the more traditional uh taking a drug to market clinical trial model that some of the psychedelic pharma companies are going down now do you think these two models can coexist or what how do you yeah what are your thoughts on on this um how this might change the game really how something like the oregon model could change the way that psilocybin kind of enters the mainstream you know, it requires, uh, you know, the other side to be filled out, which is what the Oregon model does. I mean, we've created a integrated access structure where anyone can can benefit who, you know, can safely uh, undergo psilocybin services. And through doing that, there'll be infrastructure created that can capture a prescriptive model as well. You know, I think that the the core services are overlapping, it requires assessment, preparation, administration, integration. So I think the, the models between a more medical approach and a more therapeutic wellness approach have the same infrastructure. So in that sense, I think they're complementary. I see no reason why they can't sit together. I think that psychiatrists and the more medicalized model can focus on uh, clinical scenarios where we can broaden the scope a bit through a wellness and therapy program. But I think it's super important that that balance is there because I don't think that a, a strictly medicalized, prescriptive, diagnostic-based model is the appropriate dominant model for psychedelics. I'm not sure it's the appropriate dominant model for psychology and psychotherapy. Um, because these are matters of the psyche and spirit as much as, you know, the brain. And of course, there's philosophical discussions to be had in there, but that's certainly my conviction. I think that what's lost in a strictly medical model is often the humanistic approach, is the sense that you have resources within you that can be mobilized through artful facilitation. And that's different than, you know, actual medical diagnoses where you have uh, chemistry issues, you know, those exist too. So this is not an either or. What I'm looking for is an integrated framework where uh, the whole spectrum of mental wellness is understood. And I think psychedelic wellness is uh, uniquely positioned to shift the narrative in that way. And so I think it's super important I think the organ model is very important, not just in the, all the people that it can reach and potentially provide healing for, but also for what it represents. I think there really needs to be a shift in the narrative around mental health. The status quo isn't working, certainly not here in Oregon. The whole conversation around the legalization of psychedelics presents us with a weird paradox because the same institutions that have led the war on drugs and failed to prevent a mental health crisis are now the ones holding the reins of legalization. And 
I think it also obscures something. The real potential of psychedelics, in my view, is that they can help us radically reframe and transform our perception. And to echo what Tom said when we spoke, they're much more than just the latest mental health drugs. So for me, the more interesting question is, if and when they're legalized, will they help us transform the culture that's been making us so sick to begin with, or will they be commoditized by it? Thanks for watching.